This morning, as we continue in our series, um, I just want to take the moment right now to pause and just go before God and pray before we get into this message. So will you bow your heads with me one, one more time? Father, we are grateful for this morning, for all the things that you're doing in our midst, Father. We celebrate uh, some accomplishments this morning. We, we see new seasons of life, but through it all, Father, we see that you are here that you are present, that, Father, you want us to uh, pick something up from today, Lord. So it is in that uh, thought process that we ask that you would allow us to, to search our hearts this morning for what you would have in store for us. So speak to us now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As you know, we started this series called Restore last week. And that is when we're looking at some of the things, some life-changing, important words found in the Bible that starts with the letters R and E, R-E. And, and I believe that these are words that are in season today because I want to talk to you today about one RE word that is renewal or renew that leads to the other RE word that is repentance. Renewal that leads to repentance. Because all of us understand that we can relate to things wearing out. I mean, everything in life wears out, right? I mean, your, your car, your house, maybe you have a favorite pair of jeans and you've worn it for a long time and they fit perfectly and you love the way you look in them and all of a sudden they start wearing out and you start seeing holes and before you know it, you have holes in the back of the pants and I know what you're wondering this morning, can I still wear them to church? And the answer is no, you cannot wear them to church because that's what my wife tells me anyway. So... When it comes to material things, we can replace them. We can replace your jeans. We can replace your shirt. But when it comes to living things, we can't replace those. Like an example, you can't replace those cute kids that you have. If they're your kids, sometimes you want to replace them, but you just can't. You can't replace living kids. So the things that you can't replace, like relationships, God wants to renew those. God wants to continue, in fact, to renew his relationship with you over and over again. And in Colossians chapter 3, there is a scripture that is for us this morning. And this is what it says. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. The Greek word that is used here for renew means to make like new and it means to give new strength. And I will paraphrase it by saying there's other RE words that it means to refresh, to renovate, to rejuvenate. It's almost to start again. And what's interesting is that we see renewal everywhere else in life. Naturally, we see it. Our bodies, you know, we sleep and then it renews in the morning. Most of the time, we wake up refreshed. We see renewal as the day turns to night. We see renewal in the seasons as the winter turns to spring. So in nature, renewal happens automatically. It's natural. And then in the Bible, we see that Jesus himself withdrew to pray so that he could be refreshed on earth. And then we see in the Bible again that God, the Almighty, the creator of the universe himself, rested and renewed and refreshed himself on the seventh day. And so renewal, you see, is part of us, and it's all around us, except you can't renew time. And you can't renew yourself. Bad news is that we're aging every single day. And it's almost really like this lost art that we have. We've, we've forgotten how to be renewed and refreshed. And, and I started thinking about it, and I think part of it is maybe cultural. Some of us uh, have so much going on that we're so busy that I think uh, a lot of us, and I think you would agree that a lot of us have lost the, the truth of renewal and refreshment. And so when the scripture talks about the words to put on, it means to sink into clothing. It means to clothe oneself. So it paints this beautiful picture of what it means to be renewed. And so one of the things I think we have to practice or some of the things that we have to learn as believers is to clothe ourselves in what the scripture is saying, this new nature. And I think the way that looks like for me is I have to remind myself every single day and where we go to God daily in the morning for me and maybe for you it's other times or throughout the day and you tell God, Father, I am a new creation because you said so. You, you bought me at a price. God, I am yours. Father, help me today. Guide me, direct me and put me in this new nature. Help me to understand this new nature. And Father, like the scripture says, help me to be more like you. And it kind of reminded me more of like a a firefighter or a nurse or a police officer. When they put on this uniform, it comes with this confidence. It comes with this 
this, almost this security, right? It, it comes with this inner strength from wearing that uniform. And that's what happens to us when we step into this new nature in Christ. It's no longer a confidence that we have, but a confidence in Christ. And there's this confidence and there's this faith and there's this boldness because God comes in and he renews us every single morning. But here's the key for us this morning. That renewal that I'm talking about can only occur if you are connected to the life source. The Bible calls it divine. The Bible calls it Jesus. When we are connected to the vine, and when we do this other word that I want to talk to you about that also starts with RE, when we do this repentance thing. And we find this in the book of Acts. Now, the book of Acts, just a quick summary of it. When you read this book, it's really fascinating because it really just starts uh, and tells you more about the early church, its movement, and how it got, start, it got started. And, most of the, and this is Peter here speaking. And in chapter 3, verse 19, this is how Peter starts. He says, repent, then, and turn to God. So this is the other RE word. Repent, then, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out at the times. And here's that word again. Refreshing may come from the Lord. Renewal will come from the Lord. This suggests that renewal or that refreshing comes from repentance. In fact, if you study repent, and the derivative of the word repent, it is mentioned 101 times in the Bible, which tells me right off the bat that this, is, this concept of cent is central to our faith. I mean, and it's central to our journey in following Christ and to being renewed, this word repentance. But as I think further about it, my reality, and maybe again it's your reality, is that our culture right now is really obsessed with avoiding anything that is uncomfortable anything that is remotely sorrowful or painful. And, and the reality is, and I'm there with you guys, or if maybe you don't struggle with this, but I, I want to think positive thoughts. I rather think positive thoughts because that gets me through the day than anything else, right? So just think happy thoughts. So I, I read something on, um, someone tweeted this week that if you can dream it, you can be it. And I love that. Who doesn't love stuff that is positive like that? I love it because I've been wanting to be the starting forward for the LA Lakers for such a long time. And I've been dreaming about that. But guess what? It's not happening. Why? Because it's not a reality for me that if I dream it, that I can be it. And, and I know I don't want to be a you know, Debbie Downer here, but sometimes those are just not true. But we are obsessed, or at least sometimes I am obsessed with happy thoughts and no suffering and no sorrow, and there's this big word that's called lamenting. Sometimes we just forget to lament everything that's going on. But our reality, again, is that a lot of us are not experiencing the life that God has purposed for us because we've lost what the Bible calls the attitude or the spirit of repentance. Or maybe we're just unwilling. So before I talk more about repentance, let's talk about what it's not. Because this is important. Repentance is not God wanting, wanting you to feel like a failure. God is not here to beat you up. And, and I want to take this opportunity to say that if you've been to church before and you've been hurt by church and, and, and there's you've been some experiences where people beat you up with some of the things that we say, you know, first of all, I want to apologize on behalf of myself, on behalf of all churches, because that's not our intent. We are here to preach God and God resurrected and let his word speak for itself. We don't have to do anything to it. So that's not it. He, God doesn't want you to feel like a failure. It may feel like it, but that's not it. It's not living your life in this kind of state of this mild depression or, or beating yourself up because somehow that becomes more spiritual. That's not repentance at all. And again, since we're in the book of Acts, in the book of Acts chapter 3, right before I read that scripture to you, this is what had happened. Peter has just preached this amazing message in the day of Pentecost. And 3,000 people gave their life over to Christ that day. The Bible says that he was led by the Holy Spirit, and that's when the first church was born. And that say right after that, him and John, another disciple, they walk into the temple. And as they walk in right by the side of the gate, they see a beggar. And the Bible calls him a lame beggar because he wasn't able to walk. And he wasn't able to walk ever since birth. He was born that way, so he had never walked a day in his life. And he's sitting at the gate doing what he's known, always known to do, which is just to beg for money. And he approaches Peter and John in the temple, and this beggar looks, for, looks at them and says, hey, you know, stretches out his arm and says, 
you got some for me? Can I have some money? And then Peter basically responds, I'm summarizing today's phrases, I'm broke, buddy. You asked the wrong person. But this is what he says. Silver or gold I don't have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Wow, that's amazing to me. Then Peter stretches out his hand and he picks up the man, helps him get up. And for the first time, this man, imagine, is standing on his feet and he's walking. And then Peter and John, after this, start walking into the temple. And the Bible says this man was like walking in with them, like literally holding on to them because he had, I mean, I, I would do the same thing. Like, take me with you wherever you're going. I want more of that, right? And they walk in and the people that are inside the temple are now seeing this, you know, happen as it happens. And this man that is now healed is walking in with them. And everyone in this place, Peter recognizes he recognizes them as his fellow Jews, and they see what just took place. And he recognizes these are the very same people that a few days before had been yelling, crucify him, crucify him, speaking of Jesus. And you would think that at that moment, the words that are going to come out of Peter's mouth are going to be words of condemnation and hate. But instead, he starts to remind them of just what they did. And when he says you in this scripture, he's not just talking about one person or the Jews. He's talking about society in general, the, the people that were there, including himself. And he, he begins to say things like, it was you who asked for a murderer to be released. It was you who asked for the Messiah, the Son of God, God himself, to be crucified and tortured. And then he says one of the most compassionate things that I think you could say at that moment. And he says that scripture that I just read to you from Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Because of that, in light of that, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that the times of refreshing may come from the Lord. In light of everything that you've done, in light of what he's done for you, repent then. So I don't want us to miss the power of that verse. I mean, that, that verse tells us everything this morning. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be washed clean so that the times of refreshing, God wants you to be refreshed and renewed as you release that weight that you may be carrying. You know, there's many people basically listening to the sound of my voice, whether you're here or listening online, that... I keep hearing, and, and I keep going back to this because it's so true that we're just tired. We're, we're, we're weary of everything that's going on, and sometimes that makes us feel a little dry in our relationship with Christ. In fact, it, it just, I love that song we sang this morning. We need a fresh wind, a fragrance of heaven, like, Lord, pour your spirit out. I, I get that. I need that this morning because maybe some of you can relate to that. You need that. But I'm here to tell you that we can get that, and he wants to give that to us. But I think that's going to come through repentance first. You see, repentance is first a changed mind. In the second letter that Paul wrote to the Corinth church, you know, he, he basically summarized. Let me summarize this whole book for you. The people were a little messed up. You know, Paul started this church, and, and then he taught them the truth, and he taught them the truth about Christ, and Christ crucified and resurrected, and the fact that he's making them known through the entire province. And somewhere along the way, maybe like in my life, somewhere along the way, they got all messed up. And they started sleeping with each other. And the Bible says that they started to teach some bad theology. And, and they drifted so far away from where Paul had started with them and taught them. And this is what Paul says, look at what you've done. So I'm summarizing the whole book of Corinthians, saving you some time. Look at what you've done. And then he says this, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Yet... In spite of all that, he says, yet, now I am happy. What? Why are you happy that we're all messed up? Now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, he says, but because your sorrow led to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Folks, listen carefully to this part. This scripture suggests that the reason we experience sorrow sometimes is because sorrow has to do a work in our life. And then he goes on to verse 10 and he says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation that leaves no regret. But he says, worldly sorrow brings death. 
Sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation, that leads no regret. Seems like a good thing to me. But then he goes on and he talks about another kind of sorrow, and he says, worldly sorrow brings death. Now he's starting to get a little deep and a little personal. So I started to think, which one do I experience? Because apparently there's two. There's godly sorrow, which is a good thing, and then we should desire that in our lives. It produces something good from God in us. And then the, Paul said that there's this other one called worldly sorrow, and it just tears us apart from the inside out, eventually causing death. So what is worldly sorrow? Well, worldly sorrow is when we view sin from our perspective and not God's. More specifically, when we view the consequences of sin in almost as an inconvenience or an annoyance. You know, I feel kind of bad about what I've done or I'm kind of sorry that I, that I did this to this other person or I'm sorry that I cheated on my wife or I cheated on my tech, whatever you may be. I'm just making stuff up. I'm kind of sorry, but Father, I don't like the way this feels. Can you just take away the feeling of me feeling sorry? Father, I don't like the struggle. I mean, I know I struggle and I'm lying, I, I, but I struggle with this, but can you just take that away because I, I don't like the way that feels. Can you remove that from me, God? And then when God doesn't do that, you wonder why. Or you blame God or, or something to that effect. And, and I started thinking like, whoa, worldly, I mean, worldly sorrow, what does that look like? Well, I read just recently, in fact, that, that there's this phrase that was coined. It, it's called, uh, the phrase is called California sober. And I found that interesting because this person says that after struggling with addiction, they say that they are now California sober, which means that they still drink and smoke a little pot, but it's okay because they're California sober. And, and, and I don't judge anybody for anything. Trust me, I really don't because I have other issues that I have to deal with myself. So I try not to be too judgmental. But when I think of worldly sorrow, I think of things that allow us to continue in the lifestyle that we enjoy. When? We know. We know. Nobody has to tell you. We know because we know that it's not okay. In contrast, godly sorrow asks, what have I done to the heart of my Savior? And you allow God to change your mind about whatever it is that is not pleasing him, and you view it not from your point of view, not from your inconvenience, but you view it from the eyes of God himself as the very thing that masks you from the intimacy with your Father. The Greek word that is used here for repent is the word metanoia. It means a change of your paradigm. It means a change of your world. It means a, a change in your thinking. It is also a change of your behavior, and it is a change in your direction. So the most comprehensive de definition is this, that repentance, or the word metanoia, is a changed mind that leads to a changed behavior. You know, one of the songs that I love that we I made sure that we sang this morning. It was awesome. It is, it is a song, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And it gives us the key on how we can go from worldly sorrow to godly sorrow. Because if you're struggling with anything, let me tell you, the only person that can change your mind is God. That is the only person that is going to give you any hope this morning. It's not the preacher man. It's not what you read. It's not... I'm here to tell you, God and God himself is going to help you through whatever it is you need help with. And he does that when you open up your heart and you pray this prayer that we sang about. And it's, it's such a powerful phrase that we sing about. And I love this song because from the first minute that I sang this song, it just captured me. And I said, I don't know if I want this, but here's what we sang this morning. It says, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. Oh, man. Man, I, I, I need to be careful when I sing that because he will do it. God, you have access to all of this mess that I have inside. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Father, change my mind. God, help me to see my rebellion, not from my perspective and how inconvenient it is to me, but from your perspective, straight from what breaks your heart. God, break my heart for what breaks yours. God, change my mind. Repentance is also a changed direction. In fact, God speaks to the prophet Ezekiel, and he shares this message with his people, the Israelites, and he says in chapter four of Eze 14 of Ezekiel, he says, Therefore say to the people of Israel, This is what the sovereign Lord says, 
There's that word again, repent. Turn from your idols and renew and renounce all of your detestable practices. So now we find out that it's not just a changed mind, but now it is a change with action attached to it. A change of behavior, more specifically, a change in your life's trajectory. Your whole direction of life changes. It says, turn from. And the thing that's most amazing about this word that we're studying, again, that word metanoia, is that it's actually a military term. Like in our day, you know, when those of you that have been in the military and you go to boot camp and you're learning how to march information, you may hear your drill sergeant say two words, about face. Weird words, but that's what they say, about face. And again, those of you in the military may recognize that. And what happens at that moment when they're marching, they stop when the drill sergeant says about face and they turn to the right once, twice, and now they're facing the opposite direction, 180 degrees. That's that word metanoia. And back then, the Roman army and the Roman guard, as they would march in formation, they would yell out, metanoia, or repent, or about face. They didn't say that back then, but it was 180 degrees, and then you would move on, and then guess what? You never looked back. Repentance is a changed mind that leads to changed behavior. And so let me just talk practically for a moment. What does that look like in your life and my life? What does that metanoia look like? Because, folks, every single one of us has at least that one thing that we need to about face from. For me, sometimes it feels like there's 50, but I'm I'm just going to focus on one today. Maybe you find yourself watching things on TV that you know, nobody has to tell you, that you know you shouldn't be watching. So you about face, and tomorrow you're going to call the cable company or whoever you need to call, and you're going to cancel that service. And you're going to say, I'm going back to rabbit ears if they still exist. That means that there is this immediate and radical response. I'm going the other direction. For some of you, you may be in a relationship that is enabling you and honestly causing you to make the choices that break God's heart, and you know it. And tomorrow you need to about face, and you get on the phone today, and you say, you know what? It's over. I'm going to date God for a year. You repent And it's radical, it's immediate, obedient to a changed mind and a changed heart. For some of you, the first step is just saying sorry and confess that sin. And maybe you're not there to be able to do that 180 because it's hard, but at least you're facing that direction. And at least you're letting God in. Maybe that's the first step. You know, in Revelation chapter 2, God is speaking again through, through John and to the churches, and God has this message to this church called Ephesus. And he's telling them, you know what? You guys are doing great. You're a great church. And then he says this, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. You know, when you fall in love with someone, you do a bunch of stuff to, to help each other fall in love with each other. And somewhere along the way, we forget to do those things again. And he's reminding us, hey, you fell in love with me, God, your Savior, your Creator. Do the things you did at first that you used to do. He's saying about face. Turn 180 and do the same things you did at first. Now, what struck me about the Scripture, this, I, I've read the Scripture so many times, but what struck me about the Scripture this time is he doesn't say, this is what I have against you. You stopped doing the things and you started doing those things. It wasn't about the sin itself. It's not like he said, hey, if you would have just kept doing the right things, the rituals, you know, go to church and all these things that we, you know, busy ourselves with. That's not what he's saying. He is saying, you forgot about me. You fell out of love with me. That's amazing to me. That, that's what it was about. It's about him and not the stuff that we're doing that is wrong. Because if it's about him, then he helps us with the stuff that we're doing that are wrong. Which really brings me to this last thought. And this is what this this is all about. That repentance is a changed mind that leads to a changed direction. But the most important part, at least to me and my heart, is that repentance restores relationships. Because it's all about relationships. The cross is all about a relationship. In fact, one of the most amazing stories in the Bible paints a story of a father and son relationship, and it summarizes everything that we've been talking about today. 
And I pray that as I say this story, that you would find yourself in this story because we're all the sun. And there's this message that God wants you to hear and wants you to know. So here's the story. The son comes to the father and says, hey, by the way, I demand my inheritance, my share of your estate, even though you're not dead yet, give it to me now. And all of a sudden, I start seeing this from a dad perspective. I'm saying, man, this kid sounds pretty entitled to me. But here's what the father does. He loves him so much that he gives him his share. And then the son starts down the road to destruction. And the Bible, in my paraphrase, pretty much says that the son goes buck wild. He takes the money and he gets himself a bunch of friends and he starts going to the nightclubs and to the bars and he's getting his buzz on and hooking up with the ladies and my paraphrase. And then the Bible says that he's spending all of his time and all of his money and all of his life is found in this nonstop party. Maybe some of you know somebody like that. Maybe some of you need to send this message on to some other people. And I think some of us do that because it, it fills this void that we feel inside. And sometimes it's alcohol, sometimes it's a toxic relationship, or something else helps fill that void. And maybe it is fun for a while because, let's face it, some of these things can be fun. But there's always a but in all of these things, right? There's always a next morning, isn't there? When you feel emptier than you felt in the first place because of the stuff that you did, I mean, why else would we have terms like walk of shame? Which, by the way, is not really that shameful anymore because they're, it's more widely accepted today. Another example of worldly sorrow. And so the money runs out in this story. And when the money runs out, the friends run out. And the Bible said that the son finds himself literally face down, sleeping, passed out in a pig pen. And then in Luke chapter 15, verse 17, we see this process that begins. And Scripture says that when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare and I'm here and I am starving to death? He knew what he had with the father and yet he's over here messing with the pigs. I mean, what do we see here? The first thing we see here is that he has a changed mind. Something changed in him. When he came to his senses, when he got to this point of saying, what have I done? And then he goes on to this debate that he has in his mind, right, that a lot of us do. Do I go home? Do I not go home? Is my father going to accept me? What is he going to say to me? I mean, I know my father loves me. My father worked his whole life so that I can have what I have. And then all I did was squander it. So he's feeling this guilt. He's feeling this shame. But then the Bible says that he made the choice. Verse 20, it says, there's the action. So he got up and he went to his father. In spite of everything he was feeling, the whole debate that he was going through in his head, he got up and he took that step towards his father. We see that he had a changed mind that leads him to getting up. And I think some of us are living right here at this morning moment. That God's breaking your heart, but what's next? The Bible says that the son began his journey back home. And he keeps rehearsing in his mind what's about to happen. I mean, imagine that same rehearsal that he's going through in this guy's mind. What is he going to say to the father? What is the father going to say to him? Is he going to accept him or is he going to kick him out? And I suspect that he had written off the father after accepting him as his son, right? Because he probably felt that that ship had sailed. He hurt him so much that he probably thought that was over. I mean, why would he think otherwise? Because we're, we're human beings, that's why. We think that way is because I think as parents, some of you guys would agree, we've most of us, I have said something to my kids to the extent of like, hey, go to your room right now. I don't even want to talk to you. Or have you ever said this, you know, I can't even look at you right now. Depart from my presence. Not in those so many words, but something like that. Why would the son think that the father wanted anything to do with him? He had hurt him so greatly. The good news for us today is that God is much bigger than we are. And his ways are higher than our ways. And, and here's what you have to hear. As the son went home, the Bible says that one of the most unbelievable phrases in all the scripture, it says, by while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. You can only do that if you're looking for him. Saw him and was filled with compassion. And he ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. 
You know, that means that day that the father was standing by the mailbox, looking down the road, asking himself, is today the day my son comes home? And I suspect if that was the case, that he stood there every single day waiting to see if he would see his son. And when he saw him, the, God, the Bible says is that God sees you. And God, he says, I'm done, and I surrender. And the son is saying, break my heart for what breaks yours. And, and God will do that. Because that's what we see here in this story. And then the father does something. He breaks out in this all-out sprint. And he doesn't even let his son get to the front door or the driver or whatever they had back then. And the father starts running down the road. And the Bible says that he threw his arms around him and that he kisses his son. And he says, my son is home. But the father said to his servants at the scripture 22, verse 22, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, which symbolizes or signifies that everything that I own, my son owns. He is an heir. Put a robe around him that says that he is not a slave and he will never be, and that he is royalty, that he is family, that he is my son, and we are going to celebrate because what was lost is now found. Here's the point. The father doesn't chastise you. The Father, our Heavenly Father, is just there waiting with His open arms, waiting to hug you and kiss you no matter what you've done. As I think of what this son did, it, it, that's pretty bad. It doesn't get worse than that. You think you're a million miles from God, and how could He want anything to do with you? Well, this story isn't about a fictitious son and a fictitious father. This story is about me and my father. This story is about you and your father. Because God wants you to know that the moment you give up and you turn to him, he wants you to know that what his response will be. You don't have to guess. It's right here. He's waiting with open arms. He accepts you. He forgives you. He loves you. And then he renews you and he refreshes you. Perhaps today is that day for you that you renew your faith and it starts with repentance. Will you pray with me? Father, I just pray this morning for every single person listening to this message right now. Lord, not just my words, Father, but for those that are listening, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just speak to their hearts. And for those that don't know what that looks like, Father, I just pray that they would say, Father, speak to me now. Lord, and I pray that you would allow us to be immediately obedient and do to what you're calling us to do in this moment. And it looks different for all, from all of us, Father, for all of us. And I know that some of you feel miles away from God right now, Lord. And, and I know that they're having a difficult time, Lord. And I just pray that you would just come to them and ever so lovingly, ever so gently, just tell them that you are there, that you love them, that you have never left them nor forsaken them. And Lord, that you are there waiting for them with open arms. And for those of you who are followers of Christ and already know God and feel God is calling you to repentance in another way, God is calling you to take some radical and immediate action to literally do about face 180 degree turn to go into the higher things. I just pray that you would say to your God right now, Father, change my mind. And there's some of you here today just need to say, God, break my heart for what breaks your, yours. And we know that he will. And some of you are profoundly aware of the things and the areas that are rebellious. And perhaps you're in this moment where you're living in worldly sorrow and it stops right now. And you say to God, Father, I repent. I repent, Father. I turn from my ways and I turn to you. Break my heart for what breaks your Father and help me to do that about face, to do that 180 turn in direction. Lord, I pray that right now, as you're speaking to your people, Father, that you would be ever so real and so present in their hearts. Lord, if this message is not for me, but if this message is from you, Lord, that you would make it known and that you would give people the courage, the strength, and the perseverance, Father, to seek you first and foremost 
Lord, and then we thank you, Father, for that refreshing, that renewal that comes from this repentance. And with an expectant heart, Father, as we walk out of these doors, we pray that we would feel refreshed as we leave this weight behind. Father, we thank you for the fact that we can just come to you as we are. We're not perfect, and you know that, and you accept us. And Lord, not only that, you welcome us with open arms. Thank you for not chastising us, Lord. I'm so grateful for that. We're so grateful for your presence here today. And it is in the powerful and beautiful name of Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen.